the perfecting of gems. This is a message about sanctification. And if I said I'm going to speak a message on sanctification, you might not be as in tune. But the perfecting of gems, and you, incidentally, are the gems that God wants to perfect. And I guess you would call that sanctification, right? In my last message, fishing tips for fishers of men was all about getting people engaged in this wonderful journey of following God. How many love to follow God? He's a good leader. I included in this uh, a clip of me catching a salmon while I was in Alaska. And Alaska is a magnificent place to be. All the mountains, the rivers, and the wildlife. In the immense solitude, it was like my son, my grandson, and I, who were on this trip together, had a private showing of God's glory. On another one of my Alaskan adventures with some sons, and you know, I don't know if the reason why my five beautiful, talented daughters got good husbands, whether it was because of all their, their attributes or because I take my son-in-laws to Alaska fishing for 11 days. I don't know which one it is. <laughs> no, but on another one of my Alaskan adventures with my sons, we rode 70 miles down the entire length of the Kenai River, which is an amazing watershed. It was from the source of the glacier-fed Kenai Lake going through a 26-mile lake and rowing that, that storms blow up on. We're and waves, huge waves, and they did come up on us, but we're rowing one at a time, because this is a, this is a, a rowboat, 21-foot drift boat. You know when these drift boats, they look like ban bananas, like that? Uh, they're great when you're going into a wave like that, but on a lake with waves coming over, it's only got about that high to the side. Anyway, we rowed across that entire lake and through the river down to just before it empties into the ocean in Cook's Inlet. It was amazing. It was awesome. And so I'll start with a clip so that I've got my story. Wow. The big, big waves. Look at this water. Just a little bit of water there. Oh, I knew we were going to get a little water. That was pretty nice. Looks All like right, it. Gentlemen, hold on. Hold on, Tig. Hold it down. Oh, 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 oh. You get video on that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that nice sitting in the back? Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's all right. Well, okay. Now that we've had the travelogue for the day, I brought back something from that trip for you today. Two rocks and a sermon. These are the two rocks. I would have handed it out, but there's too many of you. Rocks like this are formed when water freezes and then thaws and breaks into pieces those amazing mountains of granite. It's a process that God has designed 
that gets that big rock sticking up into the sky, broken down into little rocks, and then eventually makes its way down to the ocean. They look like this after traveling 70 miles on the river bottom. And fortunately, on my trip down the river, we stayed on the top of the water most of the time. But the Bible uses illustrations and objects to describe spiritual concepts and processes. The reason is, is because oftentimes it's easier to understand something like a concept in God by holding something in your hand and going, okay, that was a, a rough, jagged rock, and now it's a smooth rock after it traveled 70 miles down a steep path toward the ocean. All right? We can understand that, and we're going to talk a little bit about this process. But there's a spiritual process and concept that we want to address in the message today. And another reason that God uses objects is because quite often we are very protective of ourselves. We can hear about, you know, I know somebody who's like this, this, and this, and this, and they really got to change this way and that way. But we can't even hear it about ourselves. But if we tell a story like when Nathan the prophet came to David and told the story about the little sheep and, and, and that tragic story. And David could, when he wasn't the object of the story, he could stand objectively and go, yeah, that man is bad. And then Nathan put his finger in his face. You are that man. So quite often God will depersonalize a message and make it outside of yourself so we can even hear it. We aren't very objective about ourselves. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6. As you come to him, this is speaking of God, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built, which is shaped, into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, or look, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. A cornerstone is a stone that is placed when you built a building, originally in the old days, they used to have a plumb bob that they would use this perfect shaped rock where all the angles were correct. And they would use that as the way to true up the building and how you place that building. And everything has to be built in relationship to that cornerstone. Jesus is that cornerstone for us. But we also are living stones. And this living stone, though we start out quite rough, like the rock that was broken out of the mountain and, and fell into the water, that rough rock doesn't play well with other rocks. <coughs> Do you ever feel like a rock that doesn't play well with anyone else? No, no, I'm not, I'm going to turn that around. Do you know somebody else? who is a rock that doesn't roll well with other people. Well, have faith, because sanctification is on its way. God is committed to your sanctification. Did you know how precious you are in God's eyes? He loves you more than you could ever imagine. I keep bringing this verse up because it's one of my favorite ones. 1 John 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. And we all know the one in Matthew 10, 29, verse 31. We say these things all the time, and yet we forget about it when we get all anxious and worried. Does God care about me? Are not two 
sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. You are valuable to God. His love for you is not based on your performance or what you have to offer him. He sees you as a father sees his child, filled with hope and intent on having you develop and become all that you have the potential to become. God sees you like a miner. A gold miner sees gold in a mountain. I looked at that mountain. Believe me, I'm not a gold miner. I did meet an old, rusty old gold miner. Uh, he was a craggy old guy up there. Man, I met one. But I don't look at those mountains and see gold in them there hills. And I'm not a gemologist. God sees you like a jeweler sees a diamond in a lump of coal or a processed underneath pressure coal turned into a diamond. There's a process we must yield to to become what God created us to be. And that process requires that we go through hardship. The process of making a gem out of a rock or a ring out of a rock a piece of, that looks like you wouldn't put that on your finger. But the process requires a lot of faith. That's faith on the craftsman's part. Did you know that God, brace yourself, has faith in you? Not the faith to be saved, but he has a belief that moves him into action. He believes that when you said that I want to follow Jesus and I'm going to give you my life, he says, okay, I will act on your words to me and I will believe you. Isn't that faith? Faith is something, believing something and acting on it. So that when you make, you respond to his invitation, first of all, God's the one who does it. I don't want you to get, think I'm somehow, God. we're the ones initiating that. But God initiating and calling to you and you say, yes, I would like to follow you. <laughs> Again, we don't have a clue what we're getting into. How many of you knew what you're getting into when you gave your heart to the Lord? Yeah, that's right. Nobody's putting their hand up for that one. And I didn't have a clue. I still am sort of in the dark about the whole thing. Am I alone? A little bit of alone, what he wants to do eventually. But... God says, I will take you at your word and I will have faith enough to start putting you through the process of making a ring or a diamond out of the rough stone that, that you are. And it takes great effort and the skillful hands of a craftsman. The raw material must be processed and purified before the value can be seen. But God, who sees the end from the beginning, can see that, and he is working toward that being formed and released in you. Proverbs 17, verse 3 says, The crucible, crucible is, a, is a container with like a metal crock of some kind, over a blast furnace. And inside of that, there is silver, all the raw ore that will be one day silver. That's a crucible. The crucible is for silver, and the furnace, oh God, help me not get into the furnace, right? How many want to go through the pressure that God brings? No one wants to. And the furnace is for gold. But the Lord tests the heart. So if you feel like you're being tested, that's because you're in God's school. And he wants to make you a success, a graduate in his kingdom. Useful for him. The rock, if it had any feelings, I'm sure might protest the wonderful transformation of its journey down the river from the jagged, Un, unyielding, obstinate rock that gets caught in every crag as it's transformed by the chipping away of all these things into a round stone that's rolling, tumbling well 
playing nicely with the other stones. I bet that hard trip to sanctification, the rock might protest it, as some of us do. Zechariah 13 verse 9 says, I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. We see the silver and the gold and we go, oh yes, 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 bring it on. No, he will refine them. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. When I read that scripture verse, I see it this way. God does th some things in this verse and we do some things, right? There's a God part and there's an us part. It's almost like we're, we're dancing together as we're going toward our destiny. Holding hands with our Father in heaven who's leading us in paths of righteousness. This is a two-party system when we're talking personally, all right? I will, that's a God part, I will bring the group through the fire and make them pure. God does that. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. But they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Do you see that? There's two parts to this. This isn't just a fatalistic, I was elected. and well, how, do I, how do you know? Oh, because my mom and dad go to that church. And, I, and, you know, I'm living under the covenant. God to us and our children. Well, praise God. I'm glad that you're a covenant child. You're going to go through some hard times because God's not going to let you get away with nothing. But you better yield. You better give in. You better let that potter's hand go like this to the clay. Boom, 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 boom. <coughs> Little water. <coughs> Eventually make it into something beautiful. A vessel that's worth something. Valuable. Otherwise, all of your paternity in your Christian heritage means nothing. It won't get you through the door of heaven. You've got to fall on the floor before God and say, God, I need you. And so I yield to you. I respond to your overture to me. Today, I want you to know that God is more committed to reveal the value he's placed in you than any miner, any gemologist. Allow God to do the necessary adjustments to you so the world can see you shine. The process God uses to reveal his glory in us is called sanctification. And you know me, I'm going to ask you to say it, right? On the count of three. One, two, three. Sanctification. I want you to say it like you are excited about it. One, two, three. Sanctification. Now, I just know the person next to you isn't quite as excited about sanctification. Well, maybe he is when he's thinking about you. But I want you to end up saying it like you're excited that you are going to be sanctified. All right? One, two, three. Sanctification. Oh, God, bring it on, but have mercy on me, a sinner. The definition of sanctification, both the Hebrew word, kadash, and the Greek word, hagios. I was close. It's all Greek to me, but... It, both of them convey approximately the same meaning. To be set apart, to be purified, separation. So what that means is that God wants us to be a separate people for his own glory. It's almost like he loves us so much, he wants to end up pulling us out of the trap and the world we're in and give us a hope and a future. There are three types of sanctification if you're writing this down. First, a once and for all positional sanctification. And that is separation unto Christ at the time of salvation. When you gave Jesus your heart, 
when he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life, when he said, okay, you put your faith in me to be a Christian, young, nosed, wet behind the ears, young kid who doesn't know anything, no matter how old you are. When you said, God, would you please change me? He took you seriously, and he's going to change you. At that very moment, he sanctified you, set you apart. You were sanctified positionally. It says, you're ready for heaven. You will not be any more righteous because the right robe of righteousness that Jesus threw on your shoulders and covered your sin as he took every bit of your sin and put it on the cross and paid the price. And he said, now here's my robe of righteousness. You are holy. That is a positional sanctification. All right. There's also the second type of sanctification, practical, experiential sanctification. The progressive holiness in a believer's life. This is something we do. We cooperate with God. He gives you the power, yes. I'm not going to say that it's by yourself. You can do this. But you obey God and you follow what He tells you to do. If you are doing what God tells you to do, if you are led by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the works of the flesh. You will live righteous. If you say you love God and hate your neighbor, you are not experientially progressing very well to sanctification. In fact, he says, you're not one of mine if you keep that mode. You start living for yourself. You, you call me Lord. That means you obey, you follow God. So the, third, the second type of sanctification is the practical, experiential sanctification. And that is a process. The third one, the final or ultimate sanctification, which I am longing for, we will be changed into his perfect likeness. We won't be God, but we will look like he has declared us to be and we will be holy. And you know what? Those around us will look and go, Wow, you look marvelous. You look lovely. You look like Jesus. And, and you can say back, when we get to that all, final, ultimate sanctification, but when that happens, he'll be in heaven. It will be heaven. I wish that heaven now. would be on earth right now. That happens when Christ returns. Now, you will not be sinless, though you should aim for that, and God will give you the power, and you do not have to sin. Can I have an amen? You don't have to sin. Don't say that I sinned because temptation came. Well, everyone gets tempted. But we sin because we're drawn away by our own lusts and desires, because we disobey God. I want us to look at this rock again. Though it may be true that hidden inside of an ugly, jagged rock, there is a gem. No one but God can really see it until God runs us through the grueling process of practical sanctification. And that is something that we choose to submit to, to go through. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Well, I thought we were already sanctified. No, by context, we can tell this is God's will. Your sanctification. That is, that you... He wants to make sure you understand what he's saying. This is something that's a you thing. That you abstain from sexual immorality. Do you see my eyes here, guys? And girls. Purity. God wants fidelity from you. Not only in your actions, but your mind. You say you want sanctification? Let's get some practical sanctification. Starting in the house of God. Repent. Choose. Do your part. Abstain from sexual immorality. It's something you must do. 2 Timothy 2, 21 and 22. Therefore... If anyone cleanses himself, wow, what kind of sanctification are we talking about here? 
experiential. Something that's on your plate. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor and sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee, run from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's hard work. That's going against the current. And that's following God's spirit and saying no. Sometimes it is hard. How many acknowledge sometimes it's hard to obey God? He calls us above our own tendencies. It is true we are not saved by our own works. But the scripture is filled with stories and commands of how God tells us we need to cooperate with God's grace. God promised and gave the land of Canaan to the Israelites. But they still had a job to do. They had to go in and fight for what God gave them. Numbers 33 verse 53. Take possession of the land and settle it. This is God talking. He says, take possession of the land and settle it. For I have given you the land to possess. So, I thought he gave them the land. Why do I have to go in and take it? If you read the Old Testament, it's filled with those kind of commands. I challenge you, read and read what the scripture says. They needed to go in and fight for what God had given them. That was the experiential. The positional was, God said it, I believe it, and I, it's mine. I live that way. There's something you must do. You say, well, that's Old Testament. New Testament, it's all grace, and we're all, it's all taken care of. Well, it is. It's all taken care of. It's yours. Possess it. Grab it and make it your own. Can I have an amen from anyone? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because you can lose that if you don't do your part. If you say you love God but hate your neighbor, I'm sorry, your truth's not in you. You aren't saved. I don't care if it were you were, you weren't. I'm not going to argue that thing. If you Let that be for in heaven we can find out. But for right now, don't call yourself a Christian and disobey what he tells you to do. You better get yourself in line and do what he says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do. For his good pleasure. It's hard work to follow God. But he gives us all the power. Hallelujah. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. You will not gain holiness by standing still. Nobody ever grew holy without consenting, desiring, and agonizing to be holy. Sin will grow without sowing. But holiness needs cultivation. Follow it. It will not run after you. You must pursue it with determination, with eagerness, with perseverance, as a hunter pursues his prey. Are you chasing after God's holiness? Or are you expecting just going with the flow is going to make you holy? Going with the flow always goes downhill. Let's look at the rock again and see how that changed as it moved from the mountain down to the sea. It leaves the seclusion of the remote mountain and are forced to interact with others. And we are brought into relationship or fellowship when we're born again. Our sharp edges begin to be knocked off. You will learn to get along. You will learn to play nicely with the person next to you if you follow his spirit. They will want to sit next to you. They might even want to be married to you. I love you, Barb. I like being married to you. Do you know what? When I married my wife, I have to say, I was a little closer to the rough than to the round. 
No, seriously. And she actually might acknowledge that she was a little rougher too. But as we grew in God, things got chopped off of this. And people, if you actually enjoy a conversation with me today, well, you can thank the rock who was next to me, chipping off of me. Because I, need, I wasn't, did not roll nicely with other people. And my wife was more like she'd stay away because she didn't want to roll with anybody because, you know, they have jagged points and edges. And I challenge you, get involved with people in this body. Join a life group. Get involved in a Bible study. Get honest and real. Get into mentorship. And as you do that, you will be challenged. Proverbs 27, verse 17 as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And there's friction involved. Your brothers and sisters will instruct and love you and challenge you. To what? To change. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, what? To meet together. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near, the Lord is coming back, and there is going to come a time where we're going to be in heaven, and we'll be ultimately sanctified, and it will be great. But for right now, the world needs to see a body of believers that can hang around with each other that they want to join in with, because you've had the rough edges knocked off, and you're displaying the gem that God designed to be seen inside of you. You know, if you do this, you might also be one of the rocks, the round rocks, that God reaches into the river and picks up and go, wow, there's a giant that needs to be killed. David, it said, when he was facing his giant, went down to the brook and reached in and found five smooth stones. Smooth stone flies a little straighter than the jagged one, right? And God might just reach down and go, Ah, I think I'm going to eat Kyle. Yeah, he's getting there a little smoother. I think I'll pick him up. Okay. Ah, yeah. Jody. Yeah, nice smooth stone. Lots of things. Did you ever have things chipped off in your life? Yeah, you aren't a mom, <laughs> a wife, and a kid, a parent without having things chipped off picks up five smooth stones and God might reach down into the brook and grab you and say, now I'm going to use you to slay a giant. God wants to do this in you. It's time now for Christians everywhere to stand up and let the light be seen of Jesus in you. It's important. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. That's What kind of sanctification is that? Your good works? Experiential. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, I want us all to stand up for what is right. Choose to be adjusted shaped and transformed into living stones that reflect God's glory. That's sanctification. And also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. I want us to stand up literally. And submit to God's adjustment in your life. Because He wants to work in you to cause you to be gems that shine, useful in his kingdom, the perfecting of gems. Lord, I just reach out to you, O oh God. This is, a, this is a tough river that we're flowing in. And we have been hewn from a rock that isn't necessarily a pretty one. Uh, we have gone through our life quite a while, and we have wondered why the adversity... Some of you may be going, why is it so hard? Well, I pray, dear God, that you, by your spirit, would use this word to give an explanation to them that you have an intention to make them beautiful. 
to others. Not only are they beautiful in your eyes, that you look at them as holy and perfect and you love them and have faith and know that he who began a good work in you will complete it. Those are your words and I believe that, God. But I pray, God, that you would bring the grace to bear on each one of these rough stones that they might submit to your gemology, working on them, smoothing them preparing them to be useful in your kingdom. You are an awesome God, and we trust you, God. You are our Savior. I thank you, Lord. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you and give you his peace. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability.